Joe, you're up next, talking to us about anemones, which I think everybody knows what they look like. Ish. Hold on a second now. <laughs> uh, here we go. <clears throat> Okay, is does that look okay, guys? Yep. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. So um, I'm going to talk about anemones and um, photographs for ID purposes. Uh, every single photograph in the uh, presentation will have been taken by one or other of these two uh, point and shoot cameras. Uh, very affordable uh, and very easy to use. <clears throat> the Nikon is waterproof to 30 meters without a housing. The Olympus is waterproof to 15 meters without a housing. And if you put it, it, it into a housing, it'll go down to 45 meters, depending on the housing, of course. So anemones are um, a very beautiful plant-like animals. The, the thing is that they are weaponized animals rather than the pretty flowers that you would think they are. And they're related to uh, uh, other stinging uh, animals such as coral hydroids and jellyfish. The thing they all have in common is uh, these nematocysts, stinging cells, which are packed like a little capsule and then discharged uh, under various stimuli, and they will either cut or poison or entangle their prey. The anatomy of anemones is very simple. There's no, um, no circulation whatsoever, a very simple nervous reflex. The tentacles are used to trap prey and they then uh, feed the uh, food into the mouth and the mouth doubles up as an anus so whatever goes in, uh, whatever, what's not digested is spat out again through the same orifice and it's, it's water in the body that gives it its shape. Um, so when the, when the mouth of the anemone is closed then it's water pressure inside that will act like a hydrostatic skeleton and uh, allow the animal to change shape. So when you come to describing anemones, we look at several different aspects of their anatomy. The first is the mouth, which I've circled here. Um, and then the next thing we look at is the, the disc immediately around the mouth. Then we look at the number and pattern and distribution of tentacles. And then we need to look at the column and at the base. So here is a, a famous column. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to say much about that uh, unless you are very familiar with it because you're looking at it from the top down. And when we as divers come to anemones, we are invariably uh, hovering over them, looking down, straight down onto the very pretty flower-like appearance. But if we, if we don't look at the column, then we can't really uh, identify the animal and in many instances. So when you look at the column from the side, then you'll see all sorts of detail not visible from the bird's eye view, and that detail will allow you to make a, an accurate ID. So the columns uh, of sea anemones are individual columns attached to a hard surface, and there are over 1,000 of those, 1,000 species of those. We then have burrowing anemone-like animals, which are individual tubes. Um, individual columns which are buried in soft sediment. And then we have encrusting anemones or anemone-like animals. These are colonial and they, rather than have individual columns, they have a column that will share a common base with a neighbor. So just uh, to point out something that's also very interesting about anemones and that's their symbiotic relationship. And there are a number of uh, very well-known examples, <coughs> Nemo, uh, the clownfish is probably the, the world's most um, famous anemone symbiosis. Um, and then we have in our shores, uh, very commonly, uh, the Anemonia viridis, the snake locks anemone. This is the dull uh, grey, pale brown colour that they have until they have their symbiotic um, algae in them. And that symbiotic algae gives them this beautiful colour. You will find these in shallow waters where sunlight can reach because the algae will actually um, thrive on photo photosynthesis and there's a question as to whether the anemone can uh, derive benefit from the energy so produced. Another uh, <clears throat> symbiotic relationship which we have not seen 
so much in recent uh, years, I think at this stage, would be the, the little uh, spider crab, little spongy spider crab that would be very often found in the snake locks and enemy. But uh, keep an eye out for that in your diving because that, that is a well-established relationship. It's just that we haven't observed it much recently. And then another beautiful um, anemone is the, the uh, cloak anemone, which will drape completely over the shell of a hermit crab. And that's, it derives its common name cloak because it will drape right over the shell. It'll feed then on whatever's left by the messy uh, hermit crab. So <clears throat> in relation then to uh, just different types of anemone, some will be um, maybe harder to ID than others, but Everyone will recognize the plumose anemone. It comes in two basic colors, uh, white and orange, and I think everyone will be pretty familiar with those. Uh, when it comes to dahlia anemones, this is one of our larger anemones, up to 160 short, stout tentacles arranged in circular pattern. Uh, it's got a good broad base, which is bigger than most other anemones. And these are really, um, Another good example, actually, of a hydrostatic skeleton there, you can see that this uh, dahlia is very, very tall compared to its neighbor. It, it has closed its mouth and it has, it's got the, the hydrostatic skeleton increasing its size there. Uh, sorry, you'll also see there that on, on the side of the column, is, you've got these large verruque or warts and uh, they can, they have a sticky substance and they will attach gravel and little bits of shell and so on to their column. And then you've got these beautiful varieties of color and pattern. It's practically endless, the sort of uh, variations that you can see there. Just take a moment to consider that. That was a very hungry uh, dahlia, and it has disposed of an entire velvet crab. You can see in the background to, to the left of the image, uh, another velvet swimming crab. Uh, with its little red eye looking rather nervously over at where his brother was last seen. Elegant anemones, <clears throat> we used to call these Sargathia elegans, but now they have been renamed to Silista elegans. They are very beautiful indeed. The, the base is wider than the column. The base will stick very uh, strongly to its, uh, its uh, surface. And then the column will flare out into a disc uh, with various colors, and it's also got these little white spots which have a sticky substance. And um, it, there are said to be small pores, just visible as dark spots on the upper part of the column, but I as yet have not actually uh, been able to see those. I, I should really have a closer look at that the next time I'm in, um, but that's in the description, the official description. But I'll talk a little bit more about official descriptions and um, how sometimes we have to might maybe take them with a little pinch of salt. But in any case, the elegant anemones come with um, different varieties. And there are five main varieties. We're very lucky here in, in New Quay beside us here in uh, off the coast of Clare. Uh, we have all five varieties in the same dive site. <clears throat> so this is the Miniata variety, so-called because, it, because of its color there, orange, um, pale orange and um, brown banding. Then we have the Nivea variety, which is basically all white. And then we have Venusta, which is uh, an orangey sort of disc with white tentacles. And then we have the most beautiful of all, in my opinion, is the Silista elegans rosea, the, the beautiful pink version of this. And this, would you believe, uh, was it's exactly as I found it underwater, this image is straight out of the camera. No, no liquefying in Photoshop. That's just the way it was. Happy coincidence, which I posted up on St. Valentine's Day. Here is the fifth of the five species. It's the Orantica, and that refers to the orange tentacles, the, a variable color disc, but usually gray, as in this instance here. Now, this is an elegant anemone. But it has these very long protruding tentacles, which I am told are called catch tentacles. And here's another example of the catch tentacles. That they, the exact function of them is 
um, I haven't really researched fully, but the, the only the few papers that I found on it are dating from the 70s and 80s. So um, maybe there's a, a job of work to be done on these, but they are generally thought to be um, violent in nature in the sense that they can sting neighbors. And there's in some species, for example, the plumos and enemy also have uh, catch tentacles and a number of other anemones have catch tentacles. And they can they can feel they won't discharge into genetically similar animals. So if they're in a in a colony of their own kind, these catch tentacles can reach out and feel what's going on, but they won't fire into their own kind. They will fire potentially into other anemones, and um, perhaps even to the ending of that anemone's life. So maybe there's a bit of uh, crowding um, problems going on there and they might be looking for more space to protect their own colony. So they're, they're very interesting to observe and uh, worthy of more study. Now, the, the difficulty then with our neat descriptions of five varieties is that we get an image like this, which is the one that I showed earlier on, and it doesn't really fit any of the five patterns that I've already discussed. But you can you can see here the, the sort of the knobbly like um, teeth, shall we say, in the mouth, the, the pattern uh, and shape of the disc, the distribution and number of the tentacles, and they all fit into the Silista elegans uh, description. So that, that is another elegant anemone. It just doesn't fit into the uh, descriptions that we're used to. Here's another elegant anemone, but in this case, it's like a Siamese twin. It's um, an unusual appearance of basically two animals, but they're they're stuck together, and uh, that's another interesting observation. Another type of an enemy we have here in Connemara is the imperial an enemy, Capnia sanguina. That's uh, relating to the red color that it should have, but it comes in different colors, uh, some paler than others. But you can see there, there's a very sort of knobbly look. To those tentacles and they have uh, there are four separate rows of tentacles uh, um, in, in those circles there quite a distinctive appearance another example here very bland in color but the the um, <clears throat> the distribution and shape of the tentacles is is uh, it can't be anything else than an imperial anemone then we have the clock face anemone so called because there are 12 arms corresponding for each hour of the clock and it has a small lobed projection in the mouth. And if we highlight that, you can see here a, a very unique sort of appearance. Um, I think unique to this uh, species, although you can see there's a question mark there. Is it really unique? Uh, the people who know a lot more about anemones than I know will uh, dispute that. I'll leave that to them. They can come back and tell us when they've made up their mind. Uh, then in terms of other individual um, <clears throat> and enemies, the burrowing uh, Carianthus loidae, we'll see these a good bit in, in um, killery. And they sort of go, go down into the soft sediment there. They look very elegant, uh, especially if you can look at them from underneath and up towards the, the surface of the sea when the light comes behind them. They're very beautiful. They are miniature versions, if you like, of uh, Pachycarianthus multiplicatus, which is the firework anemone. Firework anemones are quite rare. We have them in Ailwy here and in, in Kilkiran Bay, and then there's down in Kenmare, and also in Scotland there are some sites. Uh, these are absolutely gorgeous. They've got these beautifully long, elegant uh, tentacles. They've got the, the longer outer tentacles and then inside you can see here in this image, the sort of rose colored uh, inner tentacles. These animals are up to one meter long underground. So that, that's, they're actually huge. Uh, here's a banded variety. And then we come on to encrusted anemones. These are the colonial ones where the column, if you trace the column down, you'll see that it joins a neighbor and they share a common base. Uh, this colony is uh, on the wreck in uh, Killary off Ross Row. The tentacles here are in two rings. It's very distinctive. You can see the outer ring where the tentacles are all pointing outwards and then the inner ring where they all reach for the sky. 
very beautiful and elegant. This is uh, Tony's image. Um, it's it's a better, it's a good example actually of taking, as as Maya was saying there, to take an image before you get in too close. I was I was just uh, too quickly interested in getting a nice looking image, but if you take an image from a distance or a more wide angle image, you can see here this is much more clearly colonial because you can see that some of those columns are sharing a base. And it does show you better also <clears throat> the habitat that they're on. Uh, are these everybody's favorites? Jewel and enemies, <clears throat> Coronactus viridus. They are knobbed tentacles. We have um, two, we've only got two versions of knobbed tentacles and only one of those is a soft uh, jewel. The other one I think is the Devonshire cup coral, which is, is a hard uh, skeleton. And uh, these, come in a multiplicity of colors. <clears throat> the viridus refers to the green color um, and they will grow on vertical rock faces. They like a little bit of current because they've, like all the other, um, need their food to come, come their way so that they can stick onto it. So when the food does come and land, um, the, the tentacles can release their, their weaponry and um, cause the, the animal to stick or the, whatever bit of food to stick onto the tentacle and then it can be fed in towards the mouth. Now it's very handy um, to be part of these Facebook pages, for example, the, the any um, Northeast Atlantic Nidaria group, because when you come across uh, an Nidarian and you don't know what it is, you can put it up um, in, in in, post this in the Facebook page, as I did with this example, for example, <clears throat> this, this uh, an animal was found in the midst of a sea of Sargathia elegans, and I couldn't quite see what it was, I didn't know what it was, so I, I just put it up there onto their Facebook page, and then in no time at all, you get world experts who'll come back and tell you this looks like Anthropura species, and um, it, that's exactly what it was, so that, that's very useful to have access to those experts who are uh, wonderfully willing to share their knowledge with us. Now, another example then that I, I came across was this, uh, an enemy. I hadn't seen anything like it before. I posted it up in the same uh, Nidaria Facebook page and the answer came back that this was Actinia equina. But the book says that Actinia equina uh, is a single color, the column is smooth and not patterned, and this column is clearly patterned. Now that's from the Diver's Guide to Marine Life, and as I said earlier, we maybe need to take with a pinch of salt some of the descriptions, or at least keep an open mind and make some further inquiry. So when the Nidaria group told me that this was actually a simple beadlet and enemy, um, I looked up, you know, um, the marine, the marlin, um, website and this is the typical beadlet anemone. You can see the blue beads there and the more typical uniform color of the animal. So my animal in this uh, has, has got the very clear blue beads. They're visible clearly and then at the base you can also see a little bit of blue appearing. But then you will find that other, other descriptions more clearly fit the, the animal that I have here. So where there are, for example, streaks on the column or, or um, streaks of yellow, or greenish, or pale blue. Um, so that's that's another very uh, helpful aspect of the Nidaria group that they can point you in the right direction, even if you have actually a fairly common animal with an unusual appearance. <clears throat> so um, the suggestion then was that maybe all of the strongly colored animals do have a streak underneath the color. You just can't see it because of the overlaying color. <clears throat> and the, uh, as Maya mentioned, this is the, the Marine Life Information Network website, which lists um, species A to Z and gives you great descriptions of all the different um, uh, animals that we're likely to come across there. <clears throat>